Colossians chapter 2, starting at verse 6. Colossians 2 and 6. And I'll read for our hearing. <clears throat> and now, just as you accepted Christ Jesus as your Lord, you must continue to follow him. Let your roots grow down into him and let your lives be built on him. Then your faith will grow strong in the truth you were taught and you will overflow with thanks, thankfulness. Don't let anyone capture you with empty philosophies and high sounding nonsense that comes from human thinking and from the spiritual powers of this world rather than from Christ. For Christ lives for in Christ lives all the fullness of God in a human body. So you also are complete through your union with Christ, who is head over every ruler and authority. I want to focus in on verse 6. The B portion says, you must continue to follow him. If you will, as you're taking your seats, help me introduce the title for today's message. Everyone say, keep going. Hey Amen. Take your seats. Keep going. There, there are moments when the text dances in my soul, rhythmically encircling the ethos of the passage, providing a pathway to the needs of God's people. And to that, I say, keep going. Now, I must admit, I am a child of the hip hop generation and there are moments where the text dances to a hip-hop beat. And, and although I can't, I cannot, um, what is the word? Uh, I, I can't put a, a stamp or a seal of approval on the message of the song. Every time I came back to this text, this song jumped up. Um, the, the song is by a guy named Freeway. And on it, he had Benny Siegel and Jay-Z. The song is called, What We Do. The message of the song talks about the difficulties of urban living. Young men without opportunities hustle to try to take care of their families. And although they know what they do is wrong, they can't help but do it because they're doing it for the right reason. They're doing it because there are no other options. And as he's going through the list of things that he's willing to do, seems that he's being prompted by fellows in the group to keep going. As the rhythm and intensity of his verse gets harder and harder, you can hear the ad lib, keep going. He hits the beat and the ideas even more, hits the punchline, hits you with everything that he has, even though what we do is wrong, keep going. And as I thought about that, I wondered how often have I not been properly encouraged to keep going? How often might I have been closer than I knew? How often might the benefits have far outweighed the cost? How often should I have not given up under the pressures, the weights, and the challenges 
I just needed somebody to say, keep going. When I was in college, I started to weight lift. And at first, I would go into the gym all by myself. And I would, you know, try to do things. I didn't completely know what I was doing. And this is well before you can find and learn how to do some of anything on YouTube or the internet. But I had a partner. Now, I partnered with somebody who was well stronger than I was. And in my mind, everything he did, I could do. In my body, everything he did, I could not do. <laughs> And I never forget there's one moment where I'm struggling to, to push a particular set of weights and it clicked in that my body said, you can't do this. And for the first time, my mind agreed. So you know what you write. And I heard my spot said, no, 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 no. You got another one in you. So what he did was he pulled the weight up lightly. Put the pressure back on me and say, keep going. Now, in my mind, I'm like, wait, you just saw I couldn't lift it up. You had to give me assistance. Why would you put the weight back on me? He said, no, keep going. I wasn't able to lift it, but I was able to hold it and let it slowly go down. When we finish, he says, this is what they call negatives. Although you're not strong enough yet to lift it, you're prepping your body to grow the muscle necessary by dealing with the weight and making your body feel what it feels like. So your body's natural response when it's stretched to a capacity is to make sure that you never reach that place and are not able to do it again. Muscle fibers are broken so they can be rebuilt stronger. But you have to be willing to sit under the weight and keep going. The weight's too heavy. You might not be able to push it up, but you ain't got to let it fall down. You just need to keep going. And as I thought about it, I thought that was the perfect inlet into this particular text in Colossians. Now, for those of you that are new to this series, we've been here for a number of weeks. We've listened to the way that Paul has engaged a community that he's not formally been introduced to. He's not been there. One of his emissaries, one of his, his students, if you will, has started a church and now this church has seen some amazing benefits, but then now they're running into some challenges. The challenges, we don't fully know. If you go through a variety of commentaries, you research what uh, the Colossians are going through, at best, we can only summarize because even in the text itself, it doesn't directly say, but only alludes to. But as Paul is writing, or the writer in the, the name of Paul, he says, and now, just as, as you have accepted Christ Jesus as your Lord, you must continue to follow him. Yes. Although you have professed him, Although you know him to be Lord, although you can recognize the magnitude of his power, you must continue to follow. The word here technically is to walk with. It was an idiom used to pattern your life after. That although you know you got to keep living. And I'll just make this about me so as not to implicate you. But there are moments where although I know, I've allowed my actions to counter or contradict what it is I say I believe. Amen. 
I know God is able, but I walk like I got to be able. I know God is powerful, but I walk like God's power can only be as strong as I am. I know God can get me through, but I act like God has left me forsaken. I know that weeping endures only for a night, but this night feels like it has been day and night and day and night. And, and I wonder when will the weeping, I, I know what I should know, but my actions don't align. Paul writing to this group says, let me tell you something, you started off well, you got the basics, you, you started in the right direction, don't stop, keep going, continue to follow. And he wants you to know why, because the more that you follow, the more that you pattern your life, the, the more that now your roots can grow down deep. We talked about this a bit last week with snow in a desert, about how in drought conditions there are still ways that there can be life deeper. And you need roots deeper so when the surface gets hot, you are connected deep enough to still get the nourishment that you need that may not be available in your immediate circumstance. But since now we've built our roots deep enough, we are nourished by a source that is greater than what our circumstances may be able to provide, we can walk in barren and desolate lands as if we are still being watered day in and day out because our roots have tapped into a source that has not run dry. He says now, the Christian life, the the true followers of Christ is not a one-time decision for fire insurance. That your following of Jesus is not just so you can say you have a card and an access point to get you into heaven and then it costs you nothing else for the rest of your life but that if you truly believed in the power that God has, it changes the way that you live every single day. That then your life has to be patterned now after Christ when you're at church, when you're at home, when you're on your job, when the person cuts you off on your way to church, and I say that because it literally happened this morning, and I felt my soul change, and my children were in the back seat, and I know they were zeroing in to see how I would respond, and the first initial responses I could not allow to come to my lips for concern for what this may do to my children. <laughs> let these roots grow down deep and let your lives be built on him. Then your faith will grow stronger. You get better, you get bigger, you get wiser as you do this because now you can overflow with thankfulness. And I love this, this is, this is the setup. I'm gonna get to the, the meat of the message in a moment. This is the setup, I want you to hear it. You keep going because you find out when you don't stop, you find even more to be thankful for. Mm. The enemy is so crafty to use our challenges that we think that the challenges are meant to stunt what God is doing. Not recognizing that the challenges are often the mechanism by which God is doing what God is doing. So if I could get you to stop the mechanism, then you don't get the product. 
And if you don't get the product, you constantly live lesser than what you could be. Only if you were willing to keep going. He says, keep going. And not only that, when you get on the other side of it, you have even more to be thankful for. It's one thing to thank God for a life that has never had issues. But it's another thing to thank God when God has brought you out of the issues. It's another thing to be able to look back and say, I remember when I did not have, and now that I do have, this is a, a moment of appreciation. I, I remember when I was not able to, but now look at what I'm able to do. I remember when my children weren't where they are now, but oh my God, look at them now. I remember when the job didn't value me, but now I have more value than I ever thought. I remember when nobody knew my name. I remember when I cried myself. I remember when. I wasn't the person that you see now. I remember when I was strung out. I remember when I let anybody do any and everything to me and look at me now. And that's a huge level of appreciation. But then we get pushed even further because there's one thing to be able to thank God when nothing is wrong. Another thing to be able to thank God after things have gone wrong have been fixed. But then the next level is when I'm entering and currently in challenges, I don't even have to wait for the completion because I have so much experience with the God that has been able to bring me through, I'm able to start thanking God even before the thing is over. It don't even make sense. I'm still in the middle of everything I'm dealing with, but now my praise begins to emanate out of my soul because I already know my God. All of a sudden now, the level of thankfulness that we can enter into challenges changes what we're able to see while we're in the challenge. And opportunities that had never been available become available for us, so the message keeps going. And now I get to my first point. It says, don't let anyone capture you with empty philosophies or house-sounding nonsense that comes from human thinking and from the spiritual powers of this world rather than from Christ. First point is empty. Everybody say empty. empty. But Paul is writing here, what the writer in the name of Paul is writing here, is not to say that there is no ability for us to gain new knowledge. Sometimes when we get to church, right, we think of things such as high-sounding wisdom or whatever to mean that God is against intelligence. That is not the case. God created you with both body and mind. God desires that you would use your mind. God recognizes that that is a gift for you. You should be able to grow and learn. You should be able to find out how to rightly appropriate new information into your life so that it could be a benefit, not just to you, but to those who are connected to you. This is a gift. This is why we do it. God is not against you learning. God is not against your knowledge. God is against the way that that knowledge seems to try to dethrone Christ. It is no issue with science and God. God created science. It's no issue between science and religion. God made these things. The challenge comes in is when we keep trying to put information in its position in a place as if it should take away what God has been and who God is, and we think that we need to add something more to Christ. As they're writing, they're talking to a community that is dealing with this thing called elemental spirits. The idea of the elemental spirits is they believe that there was a power in the elements, and that if you did not rightly uh, pay obeisance if you did not rightly make sure that these elemental spirits were happy, that they would cause havoc in your life. That if you did not do the proper rituals, if you did not live in the proper way, if you did not make sure that these things were taken care of, that now your life would be littered with negativity. 
So not only do you need to worship God, but you need to worship God, Jesus, and the spirits. That Jesus would be one of and not one above. You would have to make sure you go through them. Because if you don't go through them, then they are going to come and have havoc on you. And what Paul is saying is, this is problematic. If we believe Christ to be over, then nothing under what Christ is over do we have to worry about. Not only is he saying half of that may not be true, but even if it is, let's say it is true. The elemental spirits would be subservient to Jesus. So if I got Jesus, I got the elemental spirits already taken care of. But every time I keep worrying about the elemental spirits, it is like I am lessening who Jesus is, and now I have to go through them and not him. He says, wait, do you recognize the position that Jesus sits in? If you miss his position, it will force you to think that you're doing something that you need to do, but really has no additional value in your life because you really think this thing is as important as Jesus is. And of course, we may not believe in the elemental spirits. I don't know, maybe some of you do. But there are a variety of other philosophies and ideologies that we do believe. And they may not be coming from teachers that go and sit in the town square, but they're transitioned and communicated to us through a variety of different mechanisms. Some of us, we struggle, right? We have the philosophies of surely Christ is good and similar to like the elemental spirits, we won't call it that, but Christ surely couldn't be the only way. Just look at me and nobody will know I'm talking to you. One of the biggest struggles that a variety of people have with Christianity and the belief in Christ is that they say it feels exclusive. Do you mean to tell me that you believe that Jesus is the only way? If Jesus is the only way, what does that mean for all the Hindus? What does that mean for the Buddhist? You mean to tell me that all of those people are going to go to hell or better framed, because this is how it often comes, you're going to put all of those people in hell. That's what we hear. Now, I think... If I, if I can think of the most positive way that I can think about the challenge, I think it can come from a good place. It comes from a place that could be almost godlike, a desire not to see anyone perish, a desire not to see anyone have to deal with the, the difficulties that we would understand to reside in a place of hellish-like conditions. And so there's a beauty in desiring that people not go to hell. There's a problem in trying to make it so that nobody goes to hell. It's another problem with trying to dethrone Jesus to say now there must be other ways save Jesus to get to God. It is similar to the elemental spirits. It is us saying now there must be someone else. There must be something else. There has to be something of equal or greater power as Jesus. As soon as we have done that, our entire faith breaks down. There is no point of a cross. There is no point of the remission of sin. There is no point of access to heaven because now we're saying it could be, but it could not be. It is something as simple as that that will cause us to live as if we need Jesus and. And I've come to tell you that that's not true. We don't need Jesus and. And we don't have to think that Jesus is being exclusive because it's free and available to all. That Jesus is always the way, the truth, and the life that none get access to the Father except 
through Christ. That is not our determination, but that is God's determination. And who would we be to be able to tell the creator and author of all things that surely you have to make multiple routes to get where you want us to go or shame on you, we're choosing not to go that way. Nobody's ever told God that why we only have one son, S-U-N. Nobody's frustrated that Jupiter may have multiple moons, but we only got one. How come we don't have a ring around us, Lord? Our planet would be better. It would be more picturesque and beautiful. We're not given the ability to say how. We are given the ability to follow what has already been laid out for us. Because I can imagine the pain and the hurt that God might feel for God to wrap God's self in flesh, to come for the salvation of all of the world, and for the world to say, that ain't good enough. God, you're not good enough. We want another. I, I know that you told me that you love me, and you gave your life to prove it, but I'm not sure I want that life. Can you send me somebody else that sounds more like the way I want them to sound? Can you send somebody that looks more the way I want them to look? Can you send somebody else that might be able to do the things that I want them to do, because apparently the real God should look like the image I have made up in my own mind. He says, you gotta be careful for these empty theologies, these empty philosophies, because what they wind up doing is they wind up pouring out a power that becomes available to us. He says, it's not only thoughts like this, right? There, there are other concerns, right? Like the idea about sin. You know, we don't talk about sin at church no more. Did you know that? Like, So this is me trying to trace the trajectory of why we don't talk about sin. So this is where we are, right? We don't talk about it as much because we used to talk about it all the time. Like it was like you could not go to church without somebody telling you you're sinning and you're going to hell. Some of y'all remember that. Like, I promise, the preacher put everybody in hell every single Sunday. Because you're going to hell. You're out there drinking. You're going to hell. You're shacking up. You're going to hell. We was like this. Oh, I'm going to hell again. Right? Hell again every Sunday, yay! Like, I mean, that was it, right? Every week. Then all of a sudden, we was like, you know what? I'm tired of going to church. And them making me feel bad. So we stopped going. So then the preacher was like, well, maybe we shouldn't make them feel so bad. And they changed the message. It's your season. It's your time. Come on back. He going to bless you. You ain't going to miss it. It's coming your way. It's falling from heaven. Reach up and grab it. Reach up and grab it, right? And it was like this. Did they come back? Did they come back? Did they come back? <laughs> and it's funny, right? Like, we, we can laugh about it. But what that does is also... It tempers the level of truth that we can be willing to get. If you only come when I say things that make you feel good, then either I succumb and give you what sounds good, and you walk out with a weakened faith, and then you wonder why stuff doesn't work the way it should, and then you start looking at the church as if the church isn't working, and the fact is never that the church or God does not work. It is the fact that you have this partial idea of what truth should look like, but the pastor or the minister is too scared to be honest with you because you're going to walk out and never come back. But on the other side, I don't have to fuss at you about everything all the time. Because the Spirit of God does that very well. And if we're honest, half of it ain't the preacher. Like, I don't have to be offensive. The gospel is offensive enough. Soon as I say it, you can try to blame me. You can try to say it's me. But you know as well as I do, when you walk up out of here and you're still fuming about it in your car, you're still thinking about it later on, that ain't because I'm so intelligent or I said something so amazing. That's because the Spirit of God is convicting you. 
And without that level of conviction, without that, it does not prove the change that you need because every now and then we need to make changes in our lives or we keep living under the, the, the powers and the, the principalities that are depressing us. And so I stand as a clarion voice saying to you some of the difficulties and challenges, heartbreak and pain is because we're too scared to keep going. We don't want to keep following God. And keep going doesn't just mean you, know, you just move. It means to actually keep trying and not give up. We don't want to talk about it anymore, that there are some things that God requires of us that are hard. And they don't make sense in the natural space. And everybody else will tell you it's okay when the truth is God has other requirements. We're watching the debasement of families. Divorce is continuing to move higher and higher. And nobody wants to say, maybe this is what God was trying to tell us in the first place. This is why divorce is not good. This doesn't mean that there won't be people who get divorced. This doesn't mean that you won't do it. This doesn't mean that God won't bless you on the other side of it. But it means that there will be challenges that come your way that you could have avoided. This is why. This is why the church still preaches abstinence. And we don't even talk about that anymore. Have you, have you looked at the, like the, the sex education in schools now? It's like, <laughs> they're not they're like teaching the kids about it. It's almost like they're teaching how to, it's like a how-to. <laughs> to make sure that you're better at the age of 12 uh, about said thing, make sure you push this button, twist these knobs, and do this. And the kids are like, oh, that's what we're supposed to do. Right? Because nobody wants to say, wait a minute. What happened to the time when we actually expected people to be virgins when they got married? I know, just keep quiet, just keep looking at me. I'm... Right? Nobody wants to talk about it. Nobody wants to talk about the half of the, the disconnect and the, the lack of freedom in our finances is because we don't give back to God, we don't prioritize God, we don't save, and we've bought into the consumeristic mindset that is our country, and we wonder why God doesn't bless us. Don't worry, just put that out there. Empty philosophies. Did you know, did you know, did you know? Did you know that the American dream as a statement didn't used to mean what it means today? It was popularized by a historian in 1915. And what it actually used to mean was that America was about justice, equality, and against inequity. This is what the terminology was meant to push. And then it was taken, reused, repurposed, pushed back with a consumeristic lens to now mean that the American dream is the collection of commodities that now make you something. The house, the car, the 2.5 kids, and the white picket fence. And, but watch, watch how empty this is. Because now when that's our ideology, we take that and give that to God and say, God, you haven't been good to me because you haven't given me this empty thing. And so now, since I am 30, now, since I'm 40, now, since I'm 50, and I don't feel closer to the empty thing that you never promised you would give me in the first place, I'm wondering, God, are you still able? Because I've been praying for the empty thing over and over again, and you refuse to give me emptiness. And I don't know why you won't just fill me up with the emptiness that I've been asking for. Because God is saying, maybe I care enough about you not to give you something that is just going to deplete you worse than where you are now. But nobody wants to say it. Amen. We'll just pray about it. And if we don't get it, then it's a problem with God. Not with us. We can't even recognize that even our desires have been co-opted. Do you see it? Do you know how many things you want now that you never even thought about before? 
And let's just be honest. I'm going to say it. I'm going to say it. And um, okay, if I get in trouble, whatever. I struggle now. Watch this. I struggle. I struggle. I struggle. I struggle with streaming or church service. I struggle with streaming now because we've just got to the point where we have enough subscribers on YouTube. Well, now to watch our worship service, you might get interrupted with an ad. It's free. It's free to us. It's a service that allows the message to go out there. But now it co-ops the message of God with advertisement. And we can't always determine what the ads are. So it gives us more access but now it carries baggage that I'm like, is this the right thing? And I struggle with it. The same with Facebook. I mean, you know, whether, whatever, like, I struggle with these things. Because this helps us, but, but what, at what cost? The empty philosophies reminding us again and again, go get something else to fill the void in your life that can never fill the void, but just make you want more stuff. He says, I'm trying to protect you from these empty philosophies. I'm trying to let you know that you really don't need that other stuff. Okay. Now, I'll say this and I'll move on. I promise I'm done. <laughs> there was a season, right, where, like, the whole new thing was going around burning sage. Y'all remember that? Okay, just keep looking at me because some of y'all are like this. What you talking about, Pastor? I burn sage right now. I burn sage on the way to church. All right. Now, burning sage by itself is not problematic. Like, it's like any other aroma stuff, right? They're, they're, in fact, there's ideas that they might have antimicrobial properties, right? Antibacterial properties. I get all of that. But then there's these connections that it becomes spiritual, right? If we say we need sage to remove evil spirits, then what have we said about the Spirit of God on the inside of us? Just think about it. And I'm not against any other practice. I don't mind the practice. I'm, a, I, 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 I'm frustrated by how all of these things, slowly but surely, chop at the throne of Christ to act as if it is not big enough and amazing enough. So then, the writer goes in and gives you something different. He says, this is empty. But verse 9, for in Christ lives the fullness of God. Everybody say fool. fool. He says, I know what you have thought, but can I change the way you think about it? In Christ, there is nothing lacking. Everything that is available to God is available in Christ. So if you got Christ, you already got it all. The challenge is, since we don't walk like we got it all, we don't sense how much Christ really has. There's a story about a guy, he goes, he's talking with a guy that works at a circus. He's looking, and at the circus they have these huge, two huge elephants. I mean, absolutely gargantuan, right? And they're tied to a stake in the ground with a rope. An elephant that when it puts its foot down, the earth makes noise. is being held in place by a rope and a stake. The guy goes to the, to the man, he's like, what? Why aren't these elephants just walking out? Like, they could just up and choose and be like, oh, we out of here today. Right? How come they don't do this? He says, because when the elephants were young, we would wrap their leg with the rope, stake it to the ground, and at that point in their development, they weren't stronger than the rope. So we conditioned the elephant to believe that the rope was strong enough to hold it. The elephant, as it grew, held on to the conditioning that it wasn't stronger than the rope. 
so that even when it became stronger than the rope, it walked around and acted like the rope was stronger than it. And I've come to talk to some people that God has put the very power of God on the inside of you, that you are walking like elephants and we keep letting empty philosophies wrap our legs up and keep us in position when God wants to break you free. Can I tell you, you don't need nothing else. You don't need anything else. You don't need more of anything. You don't need more of God. You don't need more of the Spirit. You don't need more of the presence. Everything you need is already locked in Christ. And when you accept Christ, you are now given access to all of the gifting that is in Christ. The only thing that is required is you got to keep going. You got to keep walking with Christ and talking with Christ and telling them all about your problems. You got to keep learning that God has more in the tank for you. You got to say, if God be for me, who can be against me? You got to say, greater is he on the inside of me. Than he that is in the world you gotta say I know I've had some issues I know I've had some problems but I got a God that's able to solve them says I don't think you understand what's available to you you're walking like there are powers above you that can hold you down you walk in as if there's authorities that got something over your life that can stunt or not stunt. But I wish you knew. It don't matter about your boss. It don't matter who the president is. It don't matter what country you living in. It don't matter the oppressors. But the God that's on the inside of me is more. It says, This is why you keep going. Because keep going gives you more access to more information. That more information is appropriated and you're able to work and do things that you couldn't do before. So, last idea, I'm done, I promise you. So I'm in, I'm, in, I'm in school, I'm preparing for a Greek class and literally this is Greek to me. Like, it's literal Greek to me. And so one of the things that they do to try to help is they, they recognize you're probably not gonna become like a New Testament scholar, you're not gonna get the language, but there are all of these, you know, biblical software that can help. Coming along with the school, they give each of the students uh, access to this biblical software for free. You got it, just download it, you can do all this stuff. So I download it, I'm excited, man, cool. I'm about to be even more proficient than I am. But as I get into the software, I'm recognizing, man, it's a lot more stuff I gotta buy. Like, I don't have all the versions of the Bible I use. God, that's something else I gotta buy. And I have this, and then I gotta add all these other concordance. I'm like, huh, huh. Now watch this. Five or six years ago, I bought biblical software. I, I brought it, I purchased it, it was, I bought it. Now, once I had it, since I'm one of those people that hate going through all the tutorials, I got it functional, and I stopped right there. I use it weekly, but I don't use it to its capacity. So I'm preparing for school, about to buy brand new software on a whole nother system, when I already have all the things that they say I need for this current class. Not only do I not need to purchase anything else, all I gotta do is push this button and this opens up. Push this button and this opens up. Push this button and these things are connected. Push this button and it now says it all. Push this button and it pushes it out. Push this button and this begins to happen. It is already available to me. But I lived like I didn't have access to it because I didn't know what it could really do. Some of us are acting as if there's some other spiritual software we need. 
that we need to download some brand new ideologies and philosophies to help us live the full life. But can I tell you, if you would open up your manual, if you would take a few tutorials, if you would pay attention to the teachers, if you would listen to those that are opening it up for you, you might find out that everything you stand in need of, you already have access to. All you got to do is allow it to download into your spirit. I'm so glad that I already got all the stuff I need. I'm so glad that Jesus lacks nothing. I'm so glad I got power available. I'm so glad that sin can't even hold me back no more. I'm so glad that the enemy got to drop to his knees. I'm so glad that every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess the very power of our God. So keep going. I know you've been living the faith for a while. And maybe you just started and it don't feel like it's working out. Keep going. Don't stop Bible school. Don't, don't stop going to Sunday school. Don't stop your prayer groups. Keep going. Keep worshiping in your car. Keep opening the Bible at night. Keep going. Keep trying to apply those truths of God to your life because you will see the manifest glory of God show up in ways you could never think. You just got to be willing to keep going. Keep going. Keep going. I know you want to give up. Keep going. I know it's hard. Keep going. Don't let it fall from you. God did not bring you this far to leave you. Keep. Keep going. Because the power that is available to you, you haven't even begun to realize. Man, we walk around like we are not children of the king. <laughs> that God has not opened a variety of access for us as children of the king. And the enemy is always blown away. The enemy hopes that you don't figure out who you really are. Because the moment that you do, the power and authority that has been exercised over you is no longer available to the enemy. And all of a sudden now, you can speak to the enemy and tell the enemy what to do. You can say, get thee behind me, Satan. I am now under the very blood of Jesus. You can speak to your situation and say, this too shall pass. You can stand on the power of God. So, if nobody has told you recently, nobody has encouraged you, let me do it. Keep going. Pray with me.